of uh, its introdu introductory section of the Congress of the Brazilian Society of Cell Biology. Um, first, I would like to uh, thank uh, all the speakers that accepted this invitation to, to talk and discuss on this section. And we, uh, I'm, my name is Sergio Schenkman. I'm from the Federal University of Sao Paulo, UNIFESP. I'm also the editor-in-chief of, of the journal Cell Biology International that belongs to the International Federation of Cell Biology. And we will have uh, the participation of John English uh, from the Cold Spring Arbor Lab. And uh, he's also one of the main persons of the bio archive. And I was a great pleasure to have you, John. I met you the first time I see, in fact, you uh, in the in 2019 uh, American Society of Cell Biology meeting uh, when you, I have the chance to see you presenting uh, your talks about the bioarchive. We also have Claudia Bowser Medeiros from the University of Campinas, that is called UNICAMP. She's also part of the FAPESP board and Research Data Alliance. Thank you, Claudia, for joining us. Uh, uh, I think I never met you, but uh, was uh, is, I, I know your name, so it's a pleasure to, to meet you in person or at least online. Uh, then we have the presentation of Marianne uh, Vance Lewis. Marianne, I know Marianne a long time. Uh, she is from the University of Sao Paulo, uh, the Biology Institute. Uh, Marianne. Uh, has been several years working uh, as a member of the FAPESP board, scientific board, and, and also doing science in, in botany. And uh, thank you, Marianne, for joining us. And finally, we have Roger Chamas. He's also from the University of Sao Paulo. He's from the medical school. He is uh, is also representing uh, the Brazilian Academy of Science. So the idea of this uh, meeting is to discuss the importance of having open data uh, in parallel or not, let's see, with the scientific papers. And uh, we have the, the idea is to address the questions where are we prepared or are the scientists prepared to accept that how we should behave, what is open access, what is open science. Uh, in fact, we're going to discuss that. And finally, I like to propose uh, these questions uh, as main topics for discussion. So why we, we have this now, why is it important or to have open access or open science? Uh, the second question that probably uh, I think is quite uh, important to, to be addressed in this section is how the science itself will be impacted. And we're talking mainly in the area of the cell biology or the biological science. Of course, this is, is, is very, it's a very general subject because there are many areas in science. Uh, but uh, I think because of our audience, our, our meeting and uh, it, we can discuss more of this in the biological science. Um, and finally, uh, the question is, uh, what's the, the meaning of the open access in open science for the developing countries like Brazil? Uh, what, what's the impact in our, in our case? So my, I'm not going to talk much more now. I can uh, manage the discussion. And i uh, be happy to have uh, each uh, uh, speaker. Uh, so the idea is that each one of you uh, are going to talk, to have it like five men, or you know, if you need a little more, no worry. Ten minutes of presentation. Uh, that, and then uh, we, after everybody talks, we can have a discussion panel. Uh, 
of course, if anybody wants to interrupt and make a comment, please use the chat uh, so we can uh, see the, the speaker can answer that because you can sometimes see the, what what is the question or if I think uh, the question is, is important to, to stop the, the, the talk, we can ask him to, to answer, otherwise we can uh, uh, write or annotate that questions and answer at the end of your own talk or during the discussion. So by now I'm stop my sharing my screening and uh, I invite John to make his uh, presentation. Uh, thank you again all for you for, for coming and to those who are listening to this uh, panel. Thank you very much, Sergio, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, good morning, everyone from New York. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be part of the uh, of the Congress. Um, I am going to set up my screen share now. Um, so um, my first slide, uh, I'm going to be talking about preprints in both biology and medicine. And I do that from my role as a co-founder of two preprint servers. This uh, diagram is one you're all very familiar with, the, the traditional process of publishing a paper in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, you all know this very well. I don't need to explain this at all. And you also know that the process of peer review is deliberate, important, careful, uh, in, and usually rather slow. And it often results in, in the publication of a paper that is behind a paywall. My colleagues and I believe that there is a better way um, of distributing new research results, and that is the distribution of a manuscript before it is peer reviewed rather than afterwards. The, so, the manuscript, the so-called preprint. The great virtue of this uh, approach is that is, is there are two principal virtues. One is that the authors are in control of the manuscript. They get to determine exactly what's in it, um, how that content is expressed, and however long they want to write it. And they also determine when exactly the material is released because through a preprint server, there is no peer review, simply a, 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 a screening process, <clears throat> excuse me, a screening process that is fast. Um, in addition, the information is freely accessible. It can be read by anyone, anywhere. And so there is a large and often eager audience from whom the authors can hear um, in a in variety of direct ways and get rapid feedback on their work. Now, preprints are not a new idea. They have been around in physics and mathematics for more than 30 years. Um, the problem of biology and medicine has not been a technology problem, but a cultural one. And um, Steve Quake uh, from the Biohub has calculated mathematically that preprints could accelerate the pace of scientific research fivefold in a decade. And uh, the editor of, the, of MedPage today said only recently that in a pandemic, the journal publication system is really not fit for purpose when there is an urgent need for sharing the latest results. I'm going to. So um, I'm, uh, as I say, responsible for two preprint servers. They are they come from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory um, in New York, and in the case of MedArchive, they are uh, MedArchive is co-managed with Yale University and uh, BMJ in London. They are community-based services. They are not for profit. They're free to uh, do, free to use and free to read. Uh, papers are screened by uh, volunteer experts um, of a variety of disciplines, um, of over 100 of them in both cases. Um, the screening process results in a rapid distribution of a manuscript within a couple of days. 
And once posted, that manuscript can be revised any time up to the point that it is accepted by a journal. And to go along with these uh, services, we have a variety of uh, transfer pipelines, um, APIs and um, uh, repositories of XML for uh, text and data mining. Um, I don't have time to describe the screening in, in detail, but essentially it's a multi-step process. We have an in-house team of scientifically qualified uh, young people who uh, go through the manuscripts to begin with. Um, then they are see every paper uh, is seen by an expert before it goes live. Um, in the case of MedArchive, there's an additional step where a couple of clinical editors with expertise in ethics look at every paper. And if there are, if there is uncertainty about a decision, a an, an accept, reject decision on a paper, then it's escalated to the management teams. The sorts of uh, issues that result in the decline of a paper are if, if it's judged not to be science, or at least not science within the scope of the server. We require, uh, on MedArchive, we require uh, studies to have appropriate ethical approval. We require clinical trials to be registered. Um, we look for patient information that might identify the patient inappropriately and uh, ask the authors to remove that. And we are always on the lookout for um, messages from papers that might represent a danger to the public. For example, challenges to standard medical procedures. Um, and we're also on the lookout for conspiracy theories of which at the moment there are many. So as a result, BioArchive has a rejection rate that is between five and 10%, and MedArchive has varied between 20 and 40%. And I should say that um, BioArchive is now seven years old and MedArchive is only uh, 19 months old. So we are still um, making our way with some of these uh, policies. Um, in the course of uh, time, uh, BioArchive has uh, continued to grow um, it, it is uh, acquiring new manuscripts at the rate of about 3,000 a month and has now accumulated over 107,000. Uh, in these diagrams, the dark bars are the new submissions and the light bars are the revisions, which, which are running at roughly 30% of all the uh, papers that are posted. On MedArchive, um, we, have, we are currently receiving about 1,000 papers a month and there's a total of nearly 16,000. You can see that in April and May last year, there were in both servers, there were spikes of submissions. And this of course is related to the pandemic, um, which I'm going to say a little bit more about in the next slide. Um, and during that time, the usage of these sites both spiked as well. But generally in, an, in a normal month, there are around 10 million page views of both sites. But in the height, the height of the uh, pandemic back in uh, May and June, um, the usage rose to about 20 million. So during the course of the pandemic, both servers have uh, posted uh, over 12,000 um, pandemic related papers. And uh, I'm not going to identify them all, but there have been many important aspects of the pandemic that have been discussed. Uh, in preprints on BioArchive and MedArchive. Um, these are just some of them. Um, and one thing I do want to point out that is that um, a lot of the more important papers um, on the servers have ended up being published by journals, but there has been some delay in that. Some of these journals are very prominent ones, Nature, the New England Journal of Medicine. But after the preprint appeared, things beneficial things started happening. So in the case of the UCSF consortium, as soon as their preprint was posted on BioArchive, they started distributing um, over 500 sets of plasmids to research groups around the world who wanted to extend their work looking for drug targets for um, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, in the case of the uh, recovery trial from Oxford University, um, once they showed that dexamethasone was effective for COVID patients, then it quickly became the standard of care around the world. And now we are seeing a number of papers on the effects of immunization 
on the emerging viral variants. Um, one important paper from Moderna and NIH appeared on BioArchive yesterday morning. So I hope I've, in these brief remarks, I've convinced you that preprints have a role to play in open science. The question is, do they also accelerate the progress of open data? So in these diagrams, I've shown you um, the number of papers on both servers which contain links to data and code. This is an opportunity we have offered to authors since July 2020. And so far, only 10% of manuscripts on BioArchive have such links and 25% on MedArchive. And in the, these donuts here, I've broken down the um, repositories where the data or code are to be found. As you can see, GitHub on, in, on both servers is a favored location. Um, NCBI also features and uh, the Open Science Framework um, also is popular. Um, however, and, and in the blue sections of these diagrams, um, other refers to an enormous number of different data repositories that authors have chosen um, over, over the course of the last 18 months. So I, I think we, we have to um, admit that open preprints on, do not um, necessarily accelerate the availability of open data, but I would need to compare these numbers with uh, what one typically finds in typical journals. Um, so there is an opportunity here to pursue uh, the cause of open data through preprints, and that is something that we are in conversation with um, several uh, groups about, with the aim of um, making it easier for authors to um, locate repositories where they might uh, be, be uh, able to, to put, deposit their data if they wish to do so. The question is, will they wish to do that? And that is is my presentation and I will look forward to further discussion. Okay, thank you very much, John, for your presentation. I think it highlights very key points on the to our discussion. And uh, I think uh, we can discuss later or if anybody wants to ask us something very specific or some clarifications. I think uh, this time we can have uh, a chance to just the clarifications. Uh, I think for me it was everything was very clear um, and direct. If there is any comment or for clarifications now, uh, otherwise we can move to the next speaker. Okay. Okay, so let's move to Claudia Bowser Medeiros that is going to present her, her, her thoughts about the, this topic. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much. It's a big honor to be here. And um, I'd like to, can you see my screen? Yes, I hope so. There you are. I'd just like to, can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you have to talk to me because when I show the screen, I cannot see anything. Okay, so please uh, talk to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so um, I am a computer scientist and um, I, am, I work with databases and I'm also a member of a PESPS coordination program in e science and data science. And I'd like to stress two key points. First of all, uh, open science and why and second uh, there was this discussion right before me about an enormous amount of repositories so I'd like to kind of advertise the opportunity we now have in the state of Sao Paulo to deposit open data in the research data network of the state of Sao Paulo 
So let's start with advantages of openness. Okay, lots of them have been already discussed in many places, such as reproducibility, auditing, saving money and time. But also openness is good scientific practice. And the idea is that through open science, what is open science? I like to define it as collaboration through sharing research outputs. So scientists will publish their research, digital research outputs in public open repositories, and they will be shared with other scientists. In fact, some of them may not have been born yet. So you're collaborating with the future when you practice open science. And these are the three main dimensions of collaborating in open science through sharing papers and this is called open access through sharing data which is open data and through sharing software and code and reusing it and in the sense data are considered to be a public good in particular I point you out to this report published on the 20th January this year about recommendations of the OECD Council concerning access to research data from public funding. And it's a very interesting report. And summing it up, data is a public good and should be shared as much as possible. Second, uh, besides being a public good and besides being part of open science and collaboration, so it would be third, publishing data increases citation and thus research visibility. This is a paper um, that was published two years ago showing that in the biological sciences, citations increase up to 25% when data are made public. That's because data may also have their own DOI so through citing data you access the papers and through citing the papers you access the data and thus data becomes kind of a lever to increase the citation and visibility of research also publishing data and open science combats fake science and this is a report from the US that shows that public trust in scientific sorry, in scientific research findings uh, increases a lot when data are made openly available. And last but not least, publishing data, publishing papers, open science accelerates scientific discovery. And this has been made very clear during and throughout the last year uh, concerning collaboration around COVID and sharing COVID-19 papers, open access and data, open data. And here you have, for instance, uh, the G7 ministers declare support and open science for COVID-19 research. Here are two main uh, repositories, open repositories, Zenodo and OpenAir, both European, but they are public and anybody can deposit there. Uh, open science against COVID-19. And last but not least, there is UNESCO and its ongoing task force on making open science mandatory or part of good scientific practices. So summing up, why open? And of course, I'm concentrating on data. It fosters reproducibility. It's good scientific practice. Okay, openness as a whole and global collaboration increases citation and research visibility. It combats fake news and accelerates scientific discovery. But this is all about why. And I'd like to talk for five milliseconds and now it's over about the where in where there are thousands of research repositories um, which are available for many sciences where people can deposit data. In particular, FAPESP 
has uh, fostered the creation of the statewide network of public research data repositories that was inaugurated in 2019 and it covers seven public universities approximately 48 campi and all each of them of these universities has its own repository and these repositories are made visible through a common metadata interface so either uh, research institutions a little by little joining this coalition so that each institution can manage its own data research data separately but they are all made visible through a common metadata catalog interface therefore making research data visible with all the good things that come with this openness and visibility and then summing up with Obrigada, um, data should be considered a public good and as such should be well taken care of and made open. And the uh, advantages of openness and open sciences, global collaboration, reproducibility, good scientific practice, increase in citation of research and visibility it combats combats fake news accelerates scientific discovery and if you are from the state of sao paulo don't forget contacting your research centers or universities to make your data visible through our public research network thank you over okay thank you claudia uh, that was very nice pre uh, and, and, and pointing presentation uh, i think i was i'm surprised because i myself didn't know so much about the uh, the fapesp initiative unfortunately and i think it was seems to be very good and i i will leave the questions for later uh, unless somebody needs a clarification that can be done quickly no So there's these questions. Uh, Should I answer it or do we leave it to the end? Um, the other, yeah, other national, uh, other Brazilian funding agencies are not yet, do not yet have their official uh, policies. The Brazilian government is establishing its own mandates, but it's still very much in the planning and in the beginning. The state of Sao Paulo is a pioneer within Brazil in, in this uh, data network, okay? Okay, thank you. So I think we can move to the next speaker. Uh, uh, we have uh, now uh, Marianne, uh, she can uh, talk. Uh, if, she has, if you don't have a presentation, you can just uh, be uh, on the screen. I will thank you again to coming, Marianne. I think uh, you, uh, we hope to have a very uh, important insights from you. <laughs> okay, so I would like to thank uh, Patricia and Sergio and Roger for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here and to contribute to the discussion on open data, open journals, and open access. Um, when uh, I was invited, uh, I wasn't really sure how I could address the points here. And I would like to make uh, one disclaim here. I will be speaking as a researcher, not as a representative from FAPESP or the University of Sao Paulo, but as a researcher working in the interface between uh, biological science and computational sciences. And I would like first to say that science, by definition, is an endeavor from humanity, humankind that depends on sharing data. So I think it's really interesting that we bring this, this, this discussion to an activity that is solely based on the fact that we share information. If we don't share information, 
we wouldn't be doing science nowadays. The point is how to share and in which situations we must share. I think this is one issue that I would like to discuss further in the panel. The other point that I would also like to bring, and I think John and Claudia have addressed the points perfectly, is that the need to share information is to enable other researchers to reuse the information and also to validate the information that has been, pub has been published, either as a preprint or a paper. But as a scientist, we need to think that someone had an idea at some point, applied for funding to do the, the experiments, at the same time that it's also contributing to uh, build human resources, either as a PhD, a master, or a postdoc. And this activity has to contribute to the future of science that Claudia very well pointed out. So there is an activity that is reading science, building an, an idea, testing through an experiment, and having funds to do that. And these fund opportunities can either be public or private. So depending on the source of funding that you have, you will have one obligation afterwards. So I would like also to bring that to the discussion. And I think when I started doing research, I had to read li the literature using current contents. And I think most of the researchers that are talking today have used current contents as a source of information. From that, we moved to PubMed, to Web of Science. And I was really pleased in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, when there was an initiative. In fact, there were two initiatives, one in Brazil, the Cielo, and in the United States and Europe, the Public Library of Science, by which those activities, those initiatives, wanted to put free all the results that were pre-reviewed in journals. And for me, as a researcher, this was very, very important because I could have access to publications that my institution didn't have the journals in the library, or I didn't have access through the portal of uh, CAPS. So those initiatives were very important to widen and spread information across the globe. Having said that, we have experienced from the early 2000s to nowadays, 20 years in which new publishers appeared, marketing was very, very intensive, and there were some distortions also regarding publication and how to validate publications and how to validate a researcher based on the number of publications, based on the number of citations. And I think open access has brought the discussion very clearly to our activity in science. So my point here is how can we go, how can we move forward from the situation in which we are now to the future. So there are some activities in which funders demand that, public funders demand that all the results are available, are made available so that the next generation can use it. The point is how to make it available, how to process the peer review or the scientific validation. And I think this is really, really important. Although open access can contribute to this peer review system, it can also uh, leave a door open in which fake news can spread. And I am not sure yet how we can filter that. 
also having several repositories doesn't mean that you have easily access to the information. We also need to think who can pay that and for how long. So what is the perennity of those databases? And I think this discussion will be addressed in the afternoon, and this is a very, very important information that we need to address. As a researcher, I was really happy to see open science and open access taking launch. But I also see that an increase in the distance between countries that are able to pay with countries that cannot pay. So I saw recently that Springer Nature has announced that there are several opportunities to have open access funding strategies, but those are not spread evenly across the world. We can see some countries that have funds for that, but the international funds, they are mostly related to cancer or to some particular diseases. They are not available to everyone. So most of the research in climate change, in biodiversity, they are not supported. So I would like to have that discussion further in the panel. And I think these are the main points that I wanted to address. Yes, that's it. These are the main points that I wanted to address. And I would like to thank again for the opportunity. Looking forward. OK, Marianne, thank you. Uh, I was sure that, uh, that you, you're going to make ser several important points. And thank you for your questions and your thoughts. Uh, and if anybody wants a clarification or a better explanation from Marianne, we have a one or two minutes for that, and then otherwise we can move to Roger. Uh, and then, uh, uh, good morning, Roger. Uh, you have to turn, yeah, yeah. I don't know you don't have also. Uh, don't have a presentation, you're going to uh, be mo more like a moderator, but I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself and why, he, 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 what's your involvement in this uh, topic of open access and open science. Uh, oh, please, thank you for coming and it was a pleasure. Uh, it, it, it's it's my it's my pleasure it's my pleasure to be here uh, at the Cell Biology Society. I thank uh, the organizers Patricia and, and Sergio for for bringing this uh, very uh, important topic. Up. Um, I've I've been um, an editor for for open access journals for uh, some time, and I I. My, my activities are in the Academic Health Center of the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, the Academic Health Center of the University of Sao Paulo is a large conglomerate of hospitals. Uh, we are eight different hospitals all together uh, and assist the, the health of uh, around uh, 20,000 20, people every week here at the medical center. Uh, and uh, we do use, yes, uh, uh, a, a lot. Uh, we are users of uh, uh, open open science information, and uh, the COVID pandemics uh, uh, clear, clear, clearly stress this uh, out. Uh, but uh, we've been uh, we've been users of of concepts of open science for for a, a while now. Indeed. Uh, Marianne mentioned about uh, the revolution of uh, from current contents to PubMed to Web of Science, these incredible platforms that uh, allow us to, to do meta analysis and uh, indeed uh, more, more, more recently, I mean, uh, the portals that NCBI has, the National Center for Biotechnology Information has, they are uh, 
and give a, a very a tremendous resource for for health sciences in particular and uh, my, my interest is in, in the cancer research area we've been uh, we, we are indeed uh, we are swimming in a notion of uh, information and uh, so somehow uh, NCBI has helped us a, a lot of that so we are users of uh, uh, open science concepts, and uh, I'm 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 really uh, very an enthusiast of of, of this uh, as a, a researcher in a public university. I, I do see the point that public research uh, uh, is must be made. The results of public of research made with public money must be made public. Uh, and we, we suffer, on the other hand, uh, with the restraints of information uh, released by, by the big pharma, uh, which, is, which is investing a huge amount of money in, in research, and uh, usually we do not have access to the information they, they, they generate. So one question I'd like to, 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 to bring here is how we value information that we put in open science uh, strategies. Uh, and how can we uh, use this value, all the work we do, and openly distribute with our colleagues, how this, uh, is, how this enters in the equation that will define the cost and afterwards the price of medicines we we use, and this is something that I'll, I'll like to to pose to the panelists uh, to to discussion. Uh, how we value our research? I mean, we I fully agree that we do need to make it public, and I fully uh, I, I I would like to to have the notion that in one point or another. Uh, even even private companies that do science based on data that we publish freely and, and uh, they, they should also be uh, public we, we should consider an embargo for a number of years but we should we should do it I, I would like to, to put this as a, a first question to our panelists if this is okay for you, Serge. Okay, Roger, thank you for joining us. I think this is important questions. And I think uh, I, I can summarize the, the questions that uh, you have. And I think Marianne also had some points. Uh, so one is regarding uh, the fact that uh, uh, the, the, that everybody's mention is the importance. I think it seems to be clear to everybody that uh, open access uh, and mainly open data, and they are not exactly the same thing, they are linked. But, uh, so open access can help to spread data uh, that otherwise would stay stored in a in an non-accessible place. And then open access is a way that everybody can uh, assess the information on the description how data was generated mainly. Uh, so we could just have data, but no clear description how that is 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 made. And finally, you have this point that uh, how you value the, who creates that. I think this is one point. My. But I think uh, we can maybe focus uh, on uh, one question that everybody mentioned uh, is regarding the creation. How we, how the, the, the data is created in terms of uh, when you put the data in the deposit, when you deposit the data, there is a creation process. And this uh, verifies or at least check whether this is reasonable. And the, and the open access, you you also have a minimal question: How you you are sure that that uh, data is 
na fake news, like Marianne said, and it will be that can be checked. And finally, the, the third question that Roger, I think, put is uh, whether this we can value or not, how, and Marianne also mentioned that, how the scientific uh, agents or the government agents or the, the, the society evaluate who produce the data. And I think these are the, 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 the points that are mentioned here. So I think I, I would like to ask uh, John and then Late, and then after Claudia, how what they think about this creation criteria, whether this is important or this is going to be uh, 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 selected lately. Um, and I think we can have all, everybody in the in the chat. Yeah. Oh, hi. Hello, Carlos Make. Uh, yeah, we uh, we are the make because he asked to participate in this panel discussion. So <laughs> uh, he's going to be in the next. One. I think the the questions about financing uh, and uh, supporting we can uh, leave for the afternoon section. Otherwise, it'd be too long. So if John can uh, and then Claudia can answer, and then I open for discussion. Uh, the creation questions, and then uh, probably the evaluation questions, how we evaluate uh, the people that publish or deposit data, and, uh, and if this is important or if this is relevant questions. I, I think the creation, in my opinion, is uh, probably more critical, but uh, I'm open to your thoughts. So please, John, can you mention? Uh, your microphone, please. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I think, frankly, that I am the least qualified person in this panel to just to to comment on the question of data. But um, I, I just a couple of thoughts, and and this is influenced very much by the fact that I work in a research institution, and I'm surrounded by scientists who have operational problems every single day. So, one question that they always, I hear asked every time the question of data comes up, and I hear it from imaging scientists or sequencers, and, and they sort of look helpless and say, okay, I am perfectly okay with depositing my data. Tell me what you want, because there is a ton of it and it's going to be immensely time-consuming, complicated, and expensive for me to uh, put it where you want me to put it. And I'm sure you don't want it all, so give me some hint as to what would be useful. And um, that seems to be one source of problem with the creation of data deposits, is simply informing or educating the practitioners as to what it is that they are supposed to be deposited. Um, then there's the second issue is um, the, the one that, that you are all very much familiar with, with which is um, a balance of time and energy with responsibility. And that is, at the moment, there are no uh, career incentives for researchers who uh, do um, provide that gift to the future, as, as, as Claudia uh, mentioned. Um, and that, I think, is a structural issue within academic institutions um, that needs to be addressed. Uh, how, how are good citizens rewarded? Um, and then I think, thirdly, there is the question of funding, and that too has, was mentioned. Um, you, I'm sure, know much more about this than I do, but we, I, I am aware that there are certain funders who are now mandating the deposition of preprints, and that was regarded as a big step forward. I don't know if there are funders who are applying equal um, requirements to the deposition of data, but it seems to me that they are the ones who hold the levers here, and if a scientist knows that her funder requires data deposition, then she is going to make much greater efforts 
to, to make that happen. And then, of course, finally, there's the problem I alluded to in my talk, which is that there are innumerable ways of depositing data. And um, there needs to be some form of education from those who, from experts in this field, to guide the practitioners to exactly what to do with it. I've, I've said enough. So, can uh, can I? Uh, sorry. Sure, sure, sure. I would like to contribute to John's argument. I think we have um, we are at the point where we have a change in culture that we are experiencing, and this change in culture needs to be clarified to the young that will follow up research activity. What is exactly the what we need? to make available and what are the criteria with which we need to deal with to make some data available. And I think you made an excellent point. I'm glad to hear that you also have the same problem that we have here in terms of what data should I put available? Because we always have to remember that there is an experiment behind it to generate the data. And depending on the experiment, you cannot reuse that particular experiment. You can use the conclusion, you can use a fixed information, but you cannot reuse the data, the raw data in itself. So I think this is one important point to be made. Thank you very much, John. Um, may I? Yeah. Okay. There are four questions actually I'd like to answer. Um, one of them concerns the chicken and the egg. Okay. Because you're talking about open access and open data. And open access within open science means journals. And Sergio uh, very clearly said something about they being interlinked. But I have uh, some very good examples of open data coming first and the paper coming after. Uh, and uh, one of them is a student of mine who works in Lawrence Berkeley Labs. His data set was cited and used in 400 uh, papers, scientific papers through three years. And it was only after these 400 citations of his data set then he decided to publish a paper describing the data set on the so-called data journal. Okay, so this is kind of the data coming first and the paper coming afterwards. And we have different orders, but they're uh, interlinked and that is why opening up your data increases your citation overall. Uh, the second uh, question, uh, it's not a question actually, but I'd like to uh, everybody to check NIH's new policies on openness and uh, policies on compulsory publishing data funded by NIH. And if you want afterwards, I can leave you the link of these policies that were published last year and they are going to be enforced for the next until uh, totally enforced within three years. But there they make it very clear how to publish your data, uh, what procedures to do to curate your data, where which repositories would be good for publishing your data. This, of course, I'm talking about NIH, but it's intimately connected with the whole uh, community, scientific community in this uh, talk. And last but not least, I said four questions, I'll just answer three, okay? Is your question about curation. Curation is expensive. It's time consuming, as everybody knows. It requires lots of work. And in all uh, of the countries that practice and enforce, actively enforce data depositing and data publishing, data management plans, and I'm talking about Western Europe, North America, 
Australia, New Zealand, uh, nowadays uh, South Korea uh, and other Asian countries. They do have uh, uh, some, uh, it's not a thing, a person, a role called data librarian or data steward. And data librarians and data stewards are professionals that are trained in library science, but they are also experts on data management. And they help, and this, uh, John knows about that in the States, okay? And we are beginning to have this in some universities in Brazil, in particular in the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, libraries and also information, uh, people from the information uh, science groups are started starting to get training to help scientists publish their data. But this is very costly, as you all know, and there are lots of studies in, in, in computer science that show that 80% of the effort in all of this that is now called artificial intelligence, data mining, data intelligent data processing, 80% of the effort comes in, first of all, curating the data, okay, and, and housekeeping. And this requires expertise in the domain, but also in, in training. It's not, there is no solution except as Marianne mentioned, uh, education. Okay, and as for cost, I know we're leaving cost to the afternoon, but I'm not going to be here in the afternoon. I'd just like to mention, I told you I talked too much. I'd like to mention that to create this, this infrastructure of the seven universities of the state of Sao Paulo, it took three years and around a hundred people working at all levels, both politically, administratively, scientifically, and implementing. What's the cost of that? That's just to establish the network. Now everybody has to contribute with the data. Who's going to pay for it? Where? Who's going to maintain it? For how long? How can it be um, accessible? So what kind of, of keywords are you going to, uh, the metadata to attach to the data so it can be findable? Okay, otherwise it's just you put something in a drawer and you forget it's there and nobody can find it, which also happens with papers, but papers have a much more traditional and standardized way of being accessible and visible and, and uh, readable. Okay, over. <laughs> okay. Um, I have uh, one other point that I could uh, raise on my uh, on my own experience. I'm editor of a journal that uh, I'll say we receive tons of submissions from China. Some of, uh, of these submissions are clearly fabricated. And uh, we, we, I check at that, I spent a lot of time doing this, and I reject that. I think um, Menke, Carlos Menkaus, who is an editor, Roger knows that. So uh, most of us know this, uh, are coming from countries like China that amazingly, they are producing a lot, they are supporting science more than in any other country. So soon this Chinese will, I think, uh, not overcome, but in terms of numbers, they will uh, have a lot of submissions. Some of them are very good. Some uh, science in China is fantastic, and but some are just, uh, and they are considering uh, uh, journals that allow impact because they want they have to publish to survive I think and uh, some of them are considering open access so what is the impact of this type of low profile science in uh, if they uh, they use open science some already adding uh, open science in journals of not so good quality 
At the same time, I read at the end of the paper that they don't, they only will share the data open and reasonable request. Uh, it's amazing that uh, somebody say that. And I, even so, I'm talking about these journals, but I saw many publications in Nature, in Science, PNS, Journal, New England Journal. They they use plasmids for the SARS-CoV-2 research, and if you trace that. You cannot find what is the plasmid, how the plasmid was made. It's amazing that they are accepting papers without giving details about uh, how that is constructed, or they quote the method that, and you go to the method, you don't see anything, or you see something else, and then you, you trace back, you never find, and then you find that somebody gave the plasmid to him, and then nobody knows the, the sequence. So it seems that at the same time to have open data and open access, we have a lot of things that people hide and they don't want to, to share. So these are two separate questions. One is the low quality information that can predominate. And I'm quite afraid how this is going to be filtered. And the second is behind the sharing data, you can also don't share the data, and then uh, and um, how that uh, can be addressed. So, what's your talk? So, I don't know if you, Roger can mention something about that, or John, or even Carlos Menke that is here. My end, what would like to comment about this questions of low quality or not sharing data that is start to to be very common in, even in top journals. I don't know if anybody wants to talk. Thank you. Okay. I guess you are absolutely right. There are many bad signs that have been published, and either data or papers should have a curation. It's peer review is not a better, the only solution. It's not fantastic, but it's the only one really we uh we have until now okay so even i do appreciate repositories like bioarchives med archives i think they are very useful and they play a role in science and they will help us i do appreciate that we have data repositories um like the ones that are being produced uh made in sao paulo but still curation is fundamental, as Sergio said before. And uh, that would at least help a little bit to decrease the bad quality of science. We had one case, and I want to mention, because it's becoming national uh, fake news. Uh, there was a, a creationist paper on PLOS One. Okay? That's bad quality of science, and that was published even though that had peer review. So curation is fundamental. That's what I can comment. Afterwards, I would like to make a question to Claudia, if I can. Just to interrupt and to add, software also needs curation, right? Because otherwise it will produce bad results. Yes. Um, Sergio, I'd like to address both of your questions. Um, on, the, on the question of low low quality, as I um, explained, um, preprint servers, not just bioarchive and med archive, but all preprint servers do not accept uh, public, uh, accept submissions based on their quality. That is not the point of a preprint. Um, one of the be great benefits of being an open preprint server is that large and enthusiastic audience that we are able to command. And within that audience, there are experts who are not shy about pointing out deficiencies of all kinds, deficiencies of execution, deficiencies of analysis. And we are also finding in our comments section and also on Twitter that people are not shy if they see a phrase in a paper like um, data available 
uh, according to reasonable requests, or they see the absence of a method section, which does not allow the work to be reproduced. So um, one of the benefits of openness is the ability of the community to weigh in outside the confines of peer review, uh, but in the context of a community response and point out deficiencies. So that's that's one that's one um, remark I would make. In to uh, Carlos's um, point about the the importance of peer review, we absolutely agree with that. Um, one of the slides I didn't have time to show is a chart that shows how slowly, um, as a response to the emergence of preprints, new forms of review and commentary are emerging. And we are seeing a sort of merging of conventional peer review, um, particularly in its more advanced forms with you know, public peer review and even named reviewers at times, with the emergence of platforms for commentary on preprints. And I think what we're going to see over the next five to 10 years is um, much more openness, not just about science, but about reactions to science. Um, and where issues or problems of the kind that you so rightly point out will be made much more evident and the responses will be much quicker than they are currently uh, in, ha than currently happen in the conventional journal publication system, where, as we all know, it can take five years for a bad paper to be retracted. Um, we had a notorious instance very early in the pandemic in fact, on the 31st of, of uh, January 2020, when a paper was posted to BioArchive uh, on a Friday afternoon and the community response to it, it implied that there were HIV sequences in the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The community response was so energetic that the authors felt compelled to withdraw the paper within 48 hours. And this by itself got a lot of attention from the media because it was said they, they, were, they marveled at the idea that science could actually work like this in real time. Now that was an extreme uh, example and I certainly wish that we, we hadn't posted that paper, but um, it, is, it gave a glimpse of how a new form of communication could emerge, which is much more rapid and much more specific and frankly, much more blunt about the deficiencies of work that is communicated to the community. Yeah, I, I would like just to make a quick comment. I agree, fantastic. I, I, I'm happy with your point. Uh, another thing is interesting. I, uh, I, I work uh, 20 years ago or more, <laughs> I don't want to say that, but with the Victor Nussens by and NYU, he, he used Victor always uh, to say that bad papers, just I forgot that nobody reads. So uh, you don't have to worry about that because they disappear. Uh, so it's also a question that uh, this has been uh, happening 30 or 40 years ago. If you publish something that uh, the community doesn't like, nobody is going to read, nobody is going to mention. So. Uh, what uh, and also maybe commenting what about Roger Sherman say? Uh, what makes the scientists? How you evaluate the scientists? It's not just the number of publications, but the consistency of the discoveries and the contribution that scientists made. So it's complicated if, if you are just counting numbers and uh impact factors or whatever you want uh, as an index of productivity what counts is what's the real contribution and i think the agencies are looking for that uh so when you have to i know for, uh, here in brazil for PSP evaluates uh, uh, what's the contribution of that particular sign scientists did and not just how many papers it published and i think nih does the same i'm sure that many other agents so evaluation uh, and how you evaluate that is is not necessarily direct if you publish things or not but if you, the quality and i think this is part what Marianne said that you need to educate our 
our evaluators to to look for that. And I know this is happening in many places. So, we, okay, this is important thing that was done, and so this is was a good result of the money that we, we gave to to produce science. So I think just uh, may I to... may I uh, sure. ask? I'd like I actually would like to ask a question from everyone, uh, but before that, um, I besides being a data a data liberator. Okay, so someone who's who really believes in publishing data so it can be reused. I I would like I've I've sent a couple of links to the chat so they can be posted afterwards, but I'd like to point you out to FAPESP's pages on open science, which is www.fapesp.br uh, slash open science because that has a list of FAPESP's initiatives with links to open access, open data, open code, and our pol well, FAPESP's policies on this, which I was looking at the comments and Luis Eugenio Mello, our scientific director, points out is something FAPESP really wants to emphasize in the there, there you are. Thank you. Um, and um, the question to all of you follows Marianne's provocation. She talks about education. Um, who should we... There is a difference between education and training. Education is part of a culture, right? And, and there, this has to be kind of embedded into everybody's mind that opening and sharing is good. Uh, but there's also training uh, so that good practices are followed. What are the steps? What are the priorities? Should we start with the young? Or should we start with the old? Or should we start with everyone? Are there priorities? Are there processes? Are there procedures? Uh, what do you people think? Because this is an ongoing debate everywhere, right? About good practices, opening and sharing. If, if I might make a stab at Claudia's interesting question. Um, again, I think there are parallels between the rise of interest in preprints and the rise of interest in open data. And um, your point about the young, um, the young required very little persuasion that preprints were a valuable contribution to the way that they communicated their science. It was their principal investigators, their senior, their seniors, who required the um, the persuasion. So I don't think the young need to be uh, uh, convinced of the value of op open data. They've grown up in a digital culture where sharing is as natural as breathing. But but to your point about training, they certainly need help in figuring out how to do it and where to do it. With the senior staff, you have issues like a much more um, conservative view, a much more careful view about competition. The, the, whether anyone says it or not, in the back of many principal investigators' minds is the question of, well, if I give, if I share my data too early or too much, then this will disadvantage me in the competitive nature of, of scientific research. And I think that's an issue that is very hard to overcome. But with the young, I think we have a very ripe audience ready to learn how to do this better. Uh, I would like to make a contribution to this discussion. I totally agree with what uh, Claudia just mentioned regarding education and training. And I thank John's comments on putting that regarding Young's and the PIs. But I think there is another issue that we are overlooking right now in all this discussion, is that we are increasing the distance between 
science that is done in Europe, North America, Australia, to the science that is done in places where internet connection or the web is not as good as, and where you cannot spread information using Twitter or any other platform, Facebook or whatever. So although the idea from Cielo and Public Library of Science by the end of the 90s, early 2000, was to enlarge access to results and what science was done without needing to pay for it in principle, okay? We are now increasing the distance from the South and from the, the I think, India, some places where you cannot have access as quick or participate in the debate as quick as North America and Europe are doing now. So I think this is, this is an issue that I haven't been able to access information how those countries and, and how those researchers are having access to this debate. I would also like to point out that there was a paper that made a relation between vaccine and autism. And this paper was published and made a huge impact on all the non-vaccinating people around the globe. And it took ages to be retracted. And people are still not aware that this was not a correct paper, although it went through peer review. So I, I guess it's not only a question of education and training, it's a question of best practices. Best, best practices are also related to cultural uh, ideologies. So I think it, we still have a long path to go. Okay, thank you, it's just that. Uh, because we are running out of time, uh, there are a few questions from the audience. Uh, that I would like to, to put. Uh, I think Irene can uh, add them, please. So, how to answer that? Uh, they, they are called the Cascade events. We try to publish in a good journal, but they don't want us, and they want us to publish somewhere else. They want to make a new journal and pay for it. Yes. Somebody else would like to comment on that. Uh, the, I think uh, this is uh, a question of the payment of the open uh, of the of the journals and the financing. We can come back to this in the afternoon section, but anyway, uh, it's an issue that uh, um, I, uh, that can be what, what, what is the importance of, of this, uh, uh, so like, because there are so many submissions that uh, journals, the, what they call good journals, screen uh, what, what those will give more impact, more marketing or whatever, you can call and then or transfer to journals that uh, cost a lot. One example is the cell send your paper to iScience uh, after they reject the first time. And the iScience is quite expensive. So it's uh, uh, then uh, how, what do you think? If you, somebody wants to answer that. Um, perhaps I could say as a journal publisher and someone who is responsible in part for a cascade journal that to some extent this distinction that the questioner points out is a historic one. What, what we have seen in, is the evolution of open access as a business model um, as well as, as a philosophy. And it so happens that the top journals in a cascade for historical reasons are subscription journals and the newer journals that are lower in the cascade are 
open access because no publisher uh, is very willing these days to start a subscription journal. So it's to some extent a historical artifact and not always um, a desire on the part of unscrupulous publishers to relieve scientists of their money. It's just a different, it's an evolution of business model. Uh, I guess this question is, is for me. Are there any recommendations regarding a uniform format? And the answer is no. Okay, the recommendations concerning format are use formats that are consensual in your field of expertise or research and that do not require specialized software that nobody has <laughs> except for you to be read okay so I do recommend if you are more interested in this topic to uh, register for the research data Alliance which is free and it has lots of discussion forums on very many issues like that where you learn a lot okay but good practice says follow the standards of your domain and uh, do not reinvent things which is really tempting of course and uh, document your data with the metadata saying how it can what software can process it what are the main attributes? Add keywords and add a description to the data file. This way it will be findable and people will be able to understand what's inside even if they cannot open or read your data. Menke wants, to, Carlos wants to say something. Yeah, just to know what's the advantage to submit RNA-Sec at FAPESP's repository or at university repository when it's much more useful to submit them at NCBI or an international one? Excellent question. You do not submit the data. You do not need to submit the data itself. Just the de description of the data, the metadata. And the description points to where the data are, which can be in a more consensual repository. What's the advantage is that this way it becomes more visible within your institution, within the state of Sao Paulo, as a scientific production of, from Brazil, funded by FAPESP. Okay. Um. Irene, thank you for the question. Um, I don't really have an answer because we we have we don't have a proper control group for this uh, for this uh, question. Um, one thing I can tell you is that um, if we look uh, two years out from the date of deposition of a, of preprints on BioArchive, we can see that at least seventy percent of what was deposited two years ago has subsequently being published uh, in a journal. And that, that process may have taken a considerable amount of time, but it, uh, as I say, at least 70% of those papers have been published in a form that we can find. We use a fuzzy matching algorithm to make those connections. And I'm sure there are papers that um, coalesce with other papers and are not findable by our strategies, but um, I don't know if that provides any reassurance in terms of your question, but I, I really can't answer that more directly. There is one question, yeah. Um, I think, thank you, Carlos, for this question. Um, how papers published in uh, a non-open science journal will be published in the repositories? Uh, this is something that actually will be subject of this afternoon's uh, 
round table. So um, that's not something that I, I can really answer. Uh, but uh, FAPES, at least from FAPES point of view, their policies and there's a description in their pages, but uh, I cannot, I cannot answer about papers. I, I am unfortunately, uh, well, unfortunately for this question, uh, a data person. But I, I was just thinking, and I'd like to point out that at Unicamp, uh, I've been recently uh, become uh, the, the person responsible for coordinating the group on Unicamp's repositories and, and data policies and everything. And uh, recently is November, okay, last year. The biggest demand and curiosity comes by order first from researchers in philosophy. Second, yes, second in biological sciences third in education okay and that's who is really and fourth in the arts and these are the ones who are really trying to publish their data and and, uh, and being interested in and in making their production uh, in data more visible which is kind of curious but biological and medical sciences are sick Uh, can I just contribute quickly to that? I think uh, when we started, one point that was mentioned is that physics and mathematics has already a cultural uh, habit to make everything available, right? So maybe this is one reflection that you have, Claudia, regarding the curiosity at Unicamp, right? Because in, in STEM, well, when you think physics and mathematics, they are already used to make it available. And regarding Carlos' comment, uh, what you can do is to submit the, the final version prior to exception to this database. This is what is recommended to do, not the paper that has been actually came out that came out where you have the reprint but the previous one this is what you can do yes. um, maybe i could also add to um what marianne said that um many uh, journals now uh, do not require authors to transfer copyright to um to the publisher um, the author retains the copyright and, and therefore retains control over the data associated with the work that's being reported. And what is, what is given is a license to the publisher to publish that particular manuscript, which does not give the publisher control over the data associated with the work. Okay, I think we end up uh, with our time uh, is... Uh, it was, I think, it was a great uh, section and discussion. We could stay here all the afternoon talking about that. I know that this is an uh, important uh, issue in science. And I think uh, uh, we hope that we can continue that uh, on other things, on other sections. And I'd like to thank everybody for uh, giving your uh, thoughts and answering the comments, especially John, Claudia, Marianne, and Roger, that also uh, participate in the Society of Cell Biology that uh, made this possible. And uh, I'd like to invite the, uh, you to to be in the second section in the afternoon. Uh, my my suggestion is that the section could also be in English if it's possible, so we can uh, uh, advertise that talking about the finance. So with this, I close the section, and thanks for everything. Thank thank you very much indeed. Thank um, you. Hope to thank have you. you next time in person, probably next year. <laughs> I look forward. Oh to no. <laughs> yes. No, Thank I'm in you. line for the vaccine already. <laughs> okay, bye. Okay, bye, -bye. Thank bye, -bye. You. Thank you.